Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another Sustainable Buildings Canada webinar. Um, today, uh, as you know, is the, the topic is solar wall. So we're going to uh, hear a lot about uh, transpired solar uh, heaters or solar collectors. Um, we'll hear from Todd what the, the, best, the best term for them is. There's a lot of different ways to say it, but um, I'm just going to give you a few things. My name's Adam Jones. Uh, those of you who have been on uh, any of the webinars lately know me. Um, as usual, I'm going to go through a few of the things uh, that we're going to see today. So let's start with uh, just a little agenda. Here is um, we're at the top here uh, with the welcome and introduction. Um, and then we're going to hand it over to Todd and he's going to go through um, the, the solar wall product give us an idea of how the systems work, where they can be used, and maybe some examples of where they have been used to great effect. Uh, we have had a lot of um, feedback from people that they're interested in, particularly in multi-unit residential buildings. So we asked Todd to sort of um, take a look at that for us. Um, and uh, so then at the uh, as he wraps up, we'll have the audience Q&A. And as always, you can send me emails via email or through the chat message here. Uh, just type it into the question pool. And if you raise your hand, virtual hand, during the uh, Q&A period, I will call on you and you can ask your question directly. Um, this year, uh, the Green Building Festival is scheduled for November 1st. So um, the topic is positive. We're trying to um, highlight the things uh, that make a positive impact. Everything was about reducing the impact and now we're trying to make positive, net positive buildings. This is what we're looking at from a bunch of different um, perspectives. Um, so if you go to gbf22.com, you can use this 25% uh, off uh, pass for the virtual um, webinar. Um, so that's SBC webinar is the code for 25% off GBF this year. As usual, you can go to our website, uh, sbcanada.org. We have a lot of great resources for new construction and for um, building retrofits. Uh, as you know, we have been spending a lot of effort on trying to push people and push the topic, um, push the information necessary forward for deep energy retrofits. Um, so please check out our resources page there and uh, keep up to date. Um, we have two upcoming webinars scheduled for August 25th and September 21st. The first on August 25th is the Joyce Center for Participation and, oh, sorry, Partnership and Innovation at Mohawk College. Uh, so many people know about this building. It uh, is the first certified net zero carbon building or zero carbon building um, as certified by CAGBC. And so we have uh, Tony Capito um, from Mohawk College who is going to go through the, the building itself, through the systems, what, how they achieved their zero carbon um, target, and also um, he's going to talk about the procurement process, um, sort of the difficulties and challenges that they faced in building, putting together a building that is so advanced uh, compared to the marketplace. What are the things you should look out for if you're trying to meet that same goal? Um, and then on uh, September 21st, we have a partnership uh, with TAF um, for the Compass Energy Modeling Benchmarking. Um, so as developed by RWDI, so you can check that out. Um, it's uh, really the, the target here is to help municipalities understand how to use that tool. Um, so there's uh, a couple of links there. Uh, if you type that out really quick, you can go check it out right now. Otherwise, um, it will be included as a link in the follow-up email from this webinar. Um, all right, so that's all the, the housekeeping stuff from me. I'm going to hand it over to Todd. Um, and welcome, Todd. Thank you for joining us today, Todd. Uh, Todd Marin of SolarWall by ConserveAll. Um, so we're really looking forward to seeing your presentation. I'm gonna give you control right now. Thank there you. you are. All right, so you should likely see there a, we go. a solar wall and a title on it. Um, we yes. can see it. All yeah, right, over thanks. Again. Thanks for having me, uh, much appreciate it. And thanks uh, to all of you for, for joining. Um, what I'll do uh, is basically just outline the solar wall technology. Um, and like Adam had suggested, there's a couple of different terms. So solar wall technically is the brand name um, for the solar wall product line. Also, it's often referred to generically as solar air heating. 
Um, sometimes a solar wall itself is called a transpired wall. Sometimes we've seen it called a heat recovery wall, um, various terms, but typically solar air heating and solar wall can be used interchangeably as the brand is very much the technology. So what I'll do is um, quickly outline the technology, go over some, uh, you know, how solar air heating sort of fits into the landscape. Um, these days and days in the future, and then um, go through sort of a host of uh, visual examples of what the systems look like, some building types in which we've integrated the system, a um, little bit of case study, a little bit about monitoring and um, performance metrics, et cetera. Um, and I will aim to do it all quickly and efficiently to leave time for, uh, for questions. Um, so uh, I guess as we go through, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or you can just hold on to them because I'm pretty good at getting through a PowerPoint quickly um, and get straight to the questions. So my name is Todd Marin. I'm Director of Market Development at uh, Conserval uh, Engineering, Conserval Systems, uh, which is the company that develops solar air heating uh, back in the 80s. Uh, I've been with the company for a little over a decade um, and I'm responsible for market development globally for, for solar wall. Um, so solar air heating has been around forever. Um, the Mayans were creating double wall systems and stuff to sort of create heating systems. It's nothing new. However, um, in the mid 1980s, uh, the president of our company, uh, John Hollick, developed solar wall system, which is basically took solar air heating from the realm of something that people did in small amounts um, or did historically to something that is commercially viable. Um, the best way to understand solar wall is to understand what it's not. So. What solar wall is designed to do is not, it doesn't generate electricity like PV or solar electric generating panels. It does not heat hot water like solar thermal water type systems. What a solar wall does is one thing. It's designed to preheat ventilation air for a building. So there's no electricity generated. What it does is it takes the solar energy and essentially instead of converting it to a different medium such as electricity or converting it through a, you know, a glycol water loop into hot water system for a building. What it does is basically it just moves the air into the building. And the easiest path to move that heated air into the building is via ventilation air, because you've got ventilation air pulling into the building all day. Uh, anyway, so um, across the years, uh, we've been around, like I said, since the mid to late 1980s. First big project uh, we did was down at the um, Ford plant down in Oakville, Ontario. Um, and in the interceding years, we got projects now in 43 countries on every continent, including Antarctica. Um, we've worked with various class, you know, world-class customers, your Fortune 500, your Fortune 1000, small mom and pop organizations. Um, so for instance, like all of the major auto manufacturers have one or many solar walls across their portfolio of buildings. Our biggest customer is the US military, just because the sheer volume of buildings they have. So um, at Fort Drum, New York, one base, we're on about 40 to 50 bases, um, both domestic and abroad for the military. So Fort Drum, New York's got 56 solar walls on one base, or 57 now on one base. Um, Susquehanna, Pennsylvania has got 103 solar walls on one base. Um, we've been received recipient of numerous awards. Probably the one that's coolest is the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, the ASME, um, which is it's hard to find a higher standard uh, authority. They created a project in their head office in New York City uh, where they identified the top um, 80 inventions of the past two centuries and they separated them into categories. Um, in the energy category, there were nine inventions that they declared the most, you know, the top inventions of the past 200 years. Uh, so you had like the light bulb and the 
the uh, Anima Canal, et cetera. Um, and then solar wall was included in that list of nine. Um, and the reason why we're uh, greeted so friendly, um, so nicely, is that we're solving a big problem in, uh, or a piece of a big problem in a climate such as the Canadian climate where space heating is dominant. Um, if you're looking at the building from an energy perspective, um, space heating is a huge, uh, huge energy hog. And so if you're able to influence that 25, 23, 30%, um, it makes a very big impact on the overall energy profile of a building. Um, solar wall systems are very often incorporated in a new design. So um, one of the beauties of the solar wall system is that it, it's not just an energy system, it's also a wall. So when you're designing your building, it becomes the wall or the cladding. Um, so on new construction, there's this tremendous number of opportunities and we're constantly being specified. Um, but when someone's looking at the existing building stock and if anyone's got kind of any sort of 2030, 2050 target, um, there's this enormous amount of retrofit stock that, that needs to be addressed. And SolarWall is really well positioned to do that. So um, further to that, the heating grid is trying to be decarbonized. So very often people will say, well, electrification of the heating grid is not really realistic because it's just huge and no one's ever going to do it. And, uh, you know, you can try, but you're never going to get there. Um, a lot of that resistance just doesn't really take into account the historical concept, context. And that is that heating fuel used to be, you know, from time immemorial, wood or euphemistically animal byproducts would be burned for heating um, that lasted until sort of the mid 1800s where there was a shift to coal and then 80 some years of coal shifted to heating oil and then 80 some years later heating oil shifted to natural gas and now we're in the process of that same shift from natural gas into elect electricity um, up north in Canada, it's a little bit behind the, the curve <clears throat> simply because heating is such a big part of our, of our mix. Um, so what we need to look for is a lot of things on the demand side. So what are ways in which we can reduce the overall heating load for a building, um, such as solar air heating, um, and that's going to allow any sort of cost associated with shifting from dirtier fuels to electric fuels um, sort of a less less of a pain point. So anything we can do on the demand side, that's what that's where solar wall really fits in um, in that decarbonization strategy. And then when you look further ahead, it's not something that really applies to many jurisdictions in Canada. However, if you just go down to the Northeast U.S., Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, um, they're experiencing significant supply shortages regionally as in the trunk natural gas supply is at its capacity. Um, and so the utilities down there are faced with the question, hey, do we invest heavily into a trunk natural gas supply increase uh, to bring more gas to the region to satisfy the demand while simultaneously trying to electrify heating? It doesn't really make sense because you're gonna have this stranded investment where you increase the gas supply. So we're seeing gas moratoriums and. Uh, many parts of New York State, Westchester County, down near um, Ithaca as well. Um, and so there becomes the, the condition in which if we forecast 15 years ahead or, or so, where you might have a winter peak demand now for electricity. And the beautiful thing about um, using solar energy for heating is it's very much aligned with solar energy for air conditioning in that solar PV, like solar electric generations highest on that burning hot day in August when everyone's air conditioning's turned up. Um, very much similarly in the heating district, uh, you've got a, very, a real alignment because on the coldest days in winter, the atmosphere is not able to hold moisture. So cold days very much align with bright and sunny days um, to the degree that in the city of Toronto, if you look at the top 50 demand days for the past decade, i.e. the coldest five days per year for 10 years, which is 50 demand days, 
um, 47 of them had above average solar radiation. So there's a real, if you're looking at it from a district perspective, there's a real alignment with solar air heating and reduction of that winter peak, that looming winter peak of electrical demand. So now we'll get to solar wall. So how does it work? Um, it's extraordinarily simple. What you have, you have a perforated metal wall that sits on the south or somewhat south-facing elevation of a building. Um, and it's got thousands and thousands of perforations. So about 200 perforations per square foot of solar wall. They're, they're not microscopic, but they're pretty darn small. Um, to the extent to which that they actually act as a pre-filter, they're, they're that small. Um, and basically, it's very simple. It sits in the sun, it warms up, and then it's connected somewhere, either at the top through the parapet or above the parapet or through the wall into a mechanical room to basically the inbound air of your ventilation unit. So it's just pulling the unit that's pulling fresh air and delivering it to the building all day. Uh, we just connect into the fresh air side of that. And then as the air is, is getting pulled through the system, the solar wall heats the air up, it travels into that uh, HVAC unit. And as far as the HVAC system is concerned, it just thinks it's warmer out that middle day in winter than it is. So instead of pulling in, you know, minus seven degree air or whatever the temperature is that day, the solar wall now takes that minus seven, brings it up to two degrees or 14 degrees or whatever we're getting from the sun that day. And now the, the load on that HVAC unit, whether it's gas or electric or propane or, or whatever, um, is significantly reduced. And then um, added benefit is if you imagine a solar wall that's cladding the entire south wall or south facing wall, of the building, you're experiencing heat loss through that wall, right? Just whatever, if the building's R12 or R18 or R3, whatever it is. Um, and that heat loss is just coming straight into that cavity and going straight back into that, um, into the building. So you're able to have this kind of eternal insulation value uh, for the area where the solar wall is during winter months. And then of course, during the summer months, the very last thing on earth you want is high volumes of superheated air pouring into the building. So what happens is it's very simple. There's a bypass system. So here's, these are, what you're looking at here are open dampers, sort of in a side view, and here's closed dampers. So what happens is during the summer months, these dampers here will close, these dampers here will open, just kind of a 100% on off, very simple control system. And now you're just pulling in fresh, regular old air. As far as the HVAC system is concerned, there just is no solar wall. It's just going straight into the unit. And then from a building envelope perspective, you now have this shaded self wall. So instead of the sun pushing down directly onto that insulation layer for the building, it's mitigated because you've got this ventilated breathing facade that self ventilates due to the stack effect of heat rising and pouring out the uppermost perforations. So you actually have a much cooler self wall in summer and it reduces the load on the building from a cooling perspective um, and it's pretty significant depending on the building i a uh, military um uh, base manager told me that on one of his buildings which is a metal building he can put his hand on the inside of the building all summer long and he can feel where the solar wall begins because it's colder there than on the other you know when he moves his hand four feet over or whatever so there's a the the purpose for installing a solar wall is 100% to heat the building, but there is a slight cooling benefit in uh, during the summer months as well. As far as that heating benefit, um, you know, how good is it? So basically, um, what you're looking at here is data from an airport in uh, upstate New York. Uh, climate very similar to, you know, Canadian, so this border hugging Canadian climate. Um, and um, in this solar wall system, you see that the temperature for the day um, is hovering somewhere around freezing. So sort of like 28 Fahrenheit up to maybe 34 Fahrenheit. Um, so sort of like minus two to plus two, uh, a little bit below that, maybe minus three, minus four throughout the day. Um, and then the inbound temperature from the solar wall uh, was peaking at about 140 F. Um, and certainly was well above 100 F for the bulk of the day. So all of the um, all of that real estate between that yellow line of the solar wall generated temperature coming into the building and that blue line, which would be the ventilation air being brought into the building, all of that is just gas that never got burned at that building. 
um, looking at it in more of a kind of graphical um, representation. Um, you'll see kind of the temperature rise throughout the day, hovering around 100, 100 F or so for most of the day. Um, and, uh, and for those of you who don't do the conversion quick, 100 F somewhere around like 50 C above ambient. Um, and then um, if you look at it from like, that's obviously like a good day, kind of a cherry picked day in, in February. But if you look at it for sort of a multiple week, three week period here, um, the average solar radiation during this period was 390 watts per square meter. So to put that in context, a beautiful sunny day, like when you walk out and everything's lovely, <laughs> that's about a thousand watts per square meter. So um, 391 as the average is sort of a mix of nice days, a mix of miserable days, and just kind of a general typical weather pattern for middle of winter, at least in that region. The average outdoor temperature was about minus four-ish. Um, and the average solar wall temperature uh, rise was was 75 degrees out. So um, significant, significant energy generated offset over the, the long term of that building. Uh, so what I'll do now is I'll just go through um, a number of visual examples, just to kind of give you an idea of the types of buildings that we've designed on, go over some details, um, get into a little bit of case study so there's some more meat on the bones, um, and then It'll be time for questions. So uh, as far as solar wall, where can it be used? Basically, any building um, that requires heat or is in a heating climate, which is like for sure all of Canada. Um, heating climate for us is basically like if you took the US and divided it in two between south and north, kind of north of that center line is viable from a solar air wall perspective. South of it, less so. We still do projects, but but um, they're only heating for a couple of months, so the benefit's not as good. Um, but as far as building types, uh, the only type that really is ruled out is kind of your typical single family residential. And the main reason for that is just because a, every solar wall is custom engineered specific to the building. So it's custom perforated, um, the framing layout, everything's custom because we do like a fluid dynamic model for each system to make sure that the air is traveling appropriately behind it. So just the upfront kind of engineering type situation, the solar wall really doesn't become viable unless, until it's about 1500 square feet in size for this, the actual solar wall system itself. And then importantly, single family residential, they don't really have inbound ventilation. Like some, some houses will have a little HRV or ERV or something, but um, we tie into big you know, ventilation, 10,000 CFM, 30,000 CFM, even something like 2400 CFM, but you need a, a constant, or semi-constant ventilation load on the building for solar wall to be viable because that's how we get the heat into the building. Um, so here's some uh, industrial type projects. This is where uh, the technology really cut its teeth, um, particularly in the early 90s, um, when you'd have these buildings with, you know, depending on what's going on inside the building, welding or something like that, you'd have massive ventilation loads, big, huge walls, um, and uh, it just made a ton of sense. So um, Owens Corning, this one's got a solar wall here. They actually installed another one on this um, east facing wall as well, uh, right after this. Here's a distribution center in UK. You'll notice the solar wall doesn't have to be black. So we have multiple colors and, and, and different profiles to sort of match with what the building's looking like. So you got multiple solar walls here. Um, these solar walls actually had their own ventilation fans behind here. And then they were distributing them via like uh, perforated ducting down the, down the building. Um, this one here in Quebec is actually still the biggest solar wall ever done. It's 102,000 square feet of solar wall. Uh, there was, I think there's 36 fans. Um, again, similarly, it, the solar wall became the ventilation system for this, for this building. Um, it was a typical kind of industrial building that we often see where you have an older building that really never synced up the ventilation with the exhaust. So back in the thirties, people would work in a big factory and there'd just be no ventilation and you know, they'd get black lung or whatever. It wasn't a good scene. And then there was, um, over the years, they'd introduce exhaust, but then very often they wouldn't balance that exhaust out with ventilation. So um, you'd have a situation where the FedEx guy shows up, the door opens and massive quantities of cold air gush into the building because there's this negative pressure issue. So often a solar wall system can be brought in to kind of address ventilation issues simultaneously with the energy 
savings. Uh, and here's some commercial type properties. So here's a showroom in Italy with sort of a fancier profile. Um, and uh, here's uh, a building in, in Switzerland that where we designed it on a curve. The beauty of solar wall is that because you're dealing with metal um, and it is the, it is the wall of the building, it's not, it doesn't have to be just an energy system kind of tacked onto the building. You can design it right in. Is because you're dealing with metal, anything you can do with metal, you can do with a solar wall. So you're not restricted to kind of like rectangles or navigating around windows and stuff like that is, is really no issue almost all of the time. Um, so for instance, here in Germany, the designer introduced these like superficial, they're not needed, these expansion joints, um, really just to mimic that floor slab sort of motif that's going on with the design. And then we got a mechanical room up here where the solar wall just kind of deeks in with some sort of ducting and goes into the intake there. So you can do pretty, um, uh, you, can, you can be very creative with a solar wall from a design perspective, simply because um, uh, anything you can do with metal, you can basically do with a solar wall system. Um, similarly here, um, in Colorado, they introduced this kind of, whatever those things are called, flutes, um, just, to, just to break up the look and give it a different appeal. Jaguar here, they're on an angle, which is a beneficial solar angle. They use a silver color, which doesn't perform quite as well as the darker colors, but still it was significant enough, again, because the cost of the solar wall, it would have been another cladding anyway. So, so much of that cost is just, the building's already getting a cladding, so might as well make a solar wall and maybe it's a few dollars more, maybe it's a few dollars less, depending on what would have been in place of that. Um, here's Ikea, this is a retrofit system. They're just putting the flashings on. It looks like they haven't finished over here, but you'll see it's done in that, what they call the corporate trade dress, that Ikea blue. Um, so again, we can match the color or whatever um, whatever it suits. Here's Marks and, Spark Marks and Sparks in England. Um, and, uh, and sometimes we'll do things like um, depending on colors, there's the colors are, um, I don't know if you can see here, there's, there's the solar absorptivity. So we know when you go from black to say dark green, the solar absorptivity goes from 0.95, meaning 5% of the sun's energy doesn't get absorbed, 95 does. When you go to dark green, um, now it goes down to 0.91. So you lose whatever that is, almost 4% of efficiency when you go to a dark green. We find in the blues and the greens and the browns, the performance holds very well when you deviate to more like um, tan and, and lighter grays, then the performance decreases. But very often, as evidenced before, the, the performance of the system, even with the lighter color, is, is sufficient enough to, to go ahead with the project. And then sometimes we just put detailing on like this. This is a high school um, in uh, Manitoba, presumably that's like, you know, team is the wildcats or the the lancers they've got there um, they got flashing to kind of match the school colors this is a toronto transit commission ttc job um, in east part of toronto where they just tied in with red flashing on 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 the base of the system just to just to harmonize with that ttc red coloring um, as far as schools and universities were we extraordinarily popular with schools um, there's a few reasons. One of them is that uh, from a technical perspective, it's often nice. You, you very often have a, a gym with a big wall that's mostly opaque. And very often the mechanical room is in close proximity to that gym. So remembering that we need to find a way to tie a duct into the intake for the fresh air. Very often there's a grill sitting right on that wall. And so it matches up really well. Um, we've had a, a really high rate of success. So for instance, in British Columbia, almost I wouldn't say every school, but most schools um, that are getting built have solar wall in, as a portion of the design. I think we're at 38 um, K-12 schools in BC alone. Um, as far as universities, uh, many universities have them across multiple campuses or sorry, multiple schools on one, or solar walls on one campus. Um, I'm thinking of like Dalhousie, um, uh, Montana State University, and we're at, we're at again we're at about forty universities that have taken solar wall on many with multiple um, solar walls in their portfolio. And and one of the things is technically they're a good fit. This is a gym wall in um, Surrey, BC, um, but also sort of optically they're a nice fit because they're very easy to understand. 
it's easy to communicate to the kids it's easy to communicate to the um to the parents uh, people like going to green schools right so here's a little newspaper article the principal mike jellema getting a bit of um sunlight 15 minutes of fame um from the solar wall system being installed at, at that high school in in, uh, in surrey they i think they did six actually at the same time um and so, so there, there's a lot of popularity with schools simply because it's so easy to communicate. It, it aligns with kind of core goal or ethic of the school, and it also sort of makes the principals happy, makes the parents happy, and it's, a, it's everyone's happy all around. Um, and then institutional buildings. So we've done a whole bunch of kind of municipal type buildings um, where you've got, like, say, a courthouse, or we've done a tremendous number of water treatment facilities because of their high ventilation demands. Um, that first one there is uh, is a gym and flash pool. So we've got lots of systems where you know, obviously for a pool, you got a high ventilation load, but you got to keep it warm. So it's like a perfect fit. Um, we're constantly have these types of projects happening all the time. And again, you just tie it into the system. This one here, it's got the, the orientation of the building is kind of not directly north south so you're, we got two south facing walls and we just tie into both of them on um, this um, nrel building nrel is like nrcan roughly speaking in the us so we we're we're on i think we're on four nrcan buildings and i think we're on three nrel buildings at this one campus their main campus in uh, i think it's in boulder uh, colorado there um and then we've got a huge number of multifamily. Um, property. So we're constantly doing multifamily buildings. Um, for instance, down in downtown Toronto, there's a whole bunch of development near the waterfront there. We're, we're on, I don't want to say all of them, but a lot. Um, and uh, often we'll just go up on a mechanical penthouse um, or there'll be some sort of de design element like in this number three. Um, this is sort of on the sides here, you can't see, but there's an insulated metal wall panel type system. So sort of a, what do you call them, like a block sort of look like squares or, or rectangles of, of the cladding. So um, again, you've got this kind of expansion joint tied in to mimic that look. And, and this is the south facing part of this apartment here, which is in a pretty high profile site, but theater underneath it. Um, and then these two are retrofits. So um, in Ontario alone, only in affordable um, housing or like, Used to be called like social housing or um, rent subsidized social housing. Um, the uh, uh, in Ontario alone, we've got about 40 um, solar wall systems. Um, so very often we would have housing provider will take like a portfolio approach and do many solar walls at one time. So it's common for us to do sort of an audit of the entire building stock for a housing provider. Um, and then identify the, the prospects and then design a solar wall, design the solar wall systems, provide the energy savings, uh, budgetary costs. And then, um, for instance, this one here in um, Windsor, uh, you'll see it's like a flat panel type solar wall system on. This is actually ties in to um, an EFIS or those exterior insulated finish systems, you know, those foam type overcladdings, which are very, very popular to reduce uh, air infiltration um, thermally, in, like put the brick in a thermally insulated space to reduce um, bricks falling and from the freeze thaw cycle um, and obviously increase the insulation value. Very often the cost of installing a solar wall, say on this self-facing stairwell wall, um, is the same as if you were gonna do the EFIS or very, very close to the same. Um, so the, um, the the cost dynamics of the solar wall system is, is sometimes it's a little bit more, sometimes it's very, very similar. And sometimes when you factor in incentives that the solar wall is able to receive, after incentives, it can become even less expensive than if you're just gonna do EFIS. So, um, so during the recladding process for a solar wall system for multifamily, uh, there's just a tremendous opportunity. And, and realistically, solar wall should be entertained anytime there's any kind of overcladding on a building because it is the overclad as well as the heating system. So it, it really makes sense from a cost perspective, but also from the fact that you may qualify for incentives where you didn't before. So for instance, um, London Middlesex housing, um, a 
two years ago, just, just prior to pandemic and construction was occurring during the pandemic, um, they did six solar walls at one time. I um, mean, the energy savings generated from the solar wall was able to justify the budgetary expense on overcladding, EFIS overcladding. So basically the solar wall energy savings carried the EFIS overcladding from an energy perspective and, and justified the expense from an energy perspective as well, if that makes sense. Um, here's a, this is a CMHC case study that was performed on uh, a solar wall at a high rise multi-res for Ottawa community housing. So right here, we've got solar wall panel, solar wall panel, and then in the middle, um, we just kind of did a similar cladding. They, they wanted this color scheme on the, um, on that stairwell. And um, the total energy reduction for the, for the heating system for the building there was 21% um, due to that uh, ventilation load. So it was 21% reduction in that, in that ventilation heating cost for the suites. And, and this unit was the entire ventilation. So it ventilated the corridor. So many older buildings, they will have the, or almost all multi-res buildings, except for the newest ones, which are sometimes different. Um, we'll have just the ventilation system works. You get rooftop air handlers um, that are just ventilating the corridors. And then the ventilation air finds itself into the suites kind of through the corridor ventilation. So um, CMHC uh, measured it, um, looked, basically looking at the hard and fast number, which is the gas bill, right, at the end of the day. Um, and they normalized it for weather. They found that there was 21% of uh, natural gas consumption, which was 11,000 a year for that building. Solar wall's got a 40 year life cycle, so uh, with no maintenance. So it just sits there as long as the wall does, right? Um, and because it was in the context of an overcladding, so this building had brick issues, um, instead of placing all the brick and doing all that, they just stuck a solar wall on. Um, and they determined that was $100,000 more than if they hadn't done it. Um, and so that's just a straight payback of basically 10 years, nine, 10 years. Um, and then if you factor in any kind of energy cost escalation or something, it would be better than 10 years. Um, but also because the solar wall was there to qualify for grant that it wouldn't qualify for funding that it wouldn't have. So if you take the funding away as 10 years, but put the funding in and it's just literally a no brainer. Um, yeah. Oh, and then one thing that's uh, of note is it said these say, this is CMHC saying this, they said these savings correspond exactly with the estimates of performance modeling done using red screen, red screen being the tool that's used to uh, do pre-feasibility for solar wall. So um, basically what our firm very often does is we'll look at a building, we'll enter a few parameters into the red screen software. Um, as long as the inputs are correct, um, you can assume that the outputs of red screen are gonna be correct or pretty much plus or minus five, six, seven percent at worst. Um, so they're very, very good, very accurate modeling as long as the inputs are good. Um, and what we find, there's also um, standards that govern the performance of air heating. So this is the SRCC standard, which is looks like a lot of numbers, but it's pretty straightforward. You've got different airflow rates um, at which buildings need to be ventilated. And then you've got basically an efficiency factor for different airflow rates, um, depending on the building. And what you'll find is red screen models line up exactly with this SRCC efficiency standards. Um, and then when you get to monitoring the system, um, you find that the performance matches up with all these modeling. So um, I think the last thing here is just modeling. So basically I'll go through it real quick because um, it won't be applicable to everyone. Very simple to monitor a solar wall. You basically make a heat meter. So you measure outside temperature, just ambient, and you measure the temperature within the duct of the solar wall, like right before the air handler. So that's gonna be the produced temperature. You take ambient and produce, there's a delta between the two, right? Subtract one from the other, you end up with the delta. Then all you need to do is just put the volume of fresh air at that delta. So whatever the CFM is, or whatever metric you use, liters per second of, of that air, uh, you put 1.08 on it or whatever it is, and now you've got a BTU number um, that your solar wall is generating. So it's very, very simple. Here's a very pseudo confusing way of stating that simplicity. You've got a solar wall here, you got a temperature sensor here. Um, you got a few things just to make sure the fan's on and damper position's on. And then you just measure temperature again here. Um, and then whatever that whatever that fan's pulling, you can either me measure that directly 
or you can make an assumption based on a test and balance report of what that fan's doing, which is often the easiest way to do it. And to be candid, sometimes it's more accurate than uh, measuring the airflow. Um, and then you get a BTU number and you're able to monitor the performance of the system. Um, here's a, this is a building, it's kind of a weird building in, in uh, Wisconsin, which is cold. And um, there's a military building where they house some equipment that needed to be kept. I think the set point was like 83 or something for the building. But if you look here, uh, solar wall system was designed on the building. Um, here's your uh, exterior temperature. So kind of dipped down. It was well below zero. Like that's like, what's that like? 26 degrees or something. So like minus four, minus five, whatever that is. Um, went up in the day to about 60. Um, but the solar wall, um, system was producing this massive temperature rise. And then if you look down at the furnace, furnace is firing on, firing on, firing on all night. Daytime, solar wall takes over. The furnace didn't even kick on once. And we were hitting a set point for that building. Like I said, they, they got to hit like 83 or something like that. So we were, we were up there at that set point. So um, uh, so solar walls, you know, the performance is, is really, um, it, re it really sort of lines up with what the modeling says. So to summarize the benefits of solar wall, um, you get free heat um, and it lasts as long as the wall lasts, so it's about a 40 year life cycle. There's no maintenance at all on the wall. You don't have to wash it, you don't have to do anything. There's no inverters, there's nothing. It just sits there on the wall um, and does what it does. It's powered, basically it's just powered by the existing ventilation system. So there's maintenance, et cetera, on your fan and air handler, but that you had that solar wall or no solar wall. So there's, there's really no maintenance. Um, and then as far as the uh, performance, we can get up to about 30% of the heating load, depending on the size of the solar wall, um, to offset that ventilation heating load. Um, typically, it's more like 22, 23. It's a huge chunk of energy. And it's also classified as renewable energy, right? Uh, depending if you're trying to hit the Toronto Green Standard, for instance, where you're looking at 5% renewables. Well, it is renewable. Um, so it, um, from a lead perspective, et cetera, you, you get those renewable energy credits in addition to the energy credits. So it's kind of like a double counted um, performance from a lead scorecard, et cetera, from zero carbon perspective. Um, and then it's just massive, massive carbon offsets. You got a 40 year life cycle, system sits there forever. Um, per square meter, your life cycle carbon offsets about five tons per square meter of solar wall. So you broadcast that against a, like say a portfolio of buildings. Um, I don't know, you're responsible for municipality, you're responsible for, um, say a campus, um, you do six solar walls, well, it might it might hit your whole target. You know, you got a 20, 30 target of, of energy reduction, you put a bunch of solar walls on it, or in a new building design, um, you're able to achieve just, just a huge, huge benefit um, to that energy, you know, whatever energy standard or whatever marker you're trying to hit. Um, so that basically sums it up. Um, what we typically do, the way we engage is, um, is we would, um, actually, maybe I should leave that back on so you can, you can take my information down if you want it. Um, way we engage is, is we just do free energy analysis. So give us a call, or send me an email, uh, one or the other, and we'll just basically look at your building, your portfolio of buildings, your 50% drawings, wherever we are in the process. And we're able to do, um, as long as the inputs are good, we're able to do a, a really good energy analysis, tell you exactly what the benefit will be, um, and then that, that affords you the opportunity to kind of take those numbers, put them in your eQuest model or whatever you're using, or, um, or give you the information for a retrofit or whether you bake it into your reclad project. Um, it's all, we'll do all that stuff sort of free of charge up front happily. Um, and then that gives you the information needed, whether you want to uh, move forward with the project. Thanks. Wow. Thanks, Todd. Uh, yep. that was great. Uh, I, as you were, um, as you're going through the presentation, I, I'm like going through the list of questions here on my other monitor and checking off the things you've covered. Um, one thing that I, I, one question that came in that I'm, I, I think will, should be quick, but maybe not, is um, uh, what incentives are there um, in Ontario for a solar wall? Do you know? Uh, right off the top yeah. of your head. So we typically, as far as a solar wall specific incentive, like you save this for solar wall. Um, we had a couple under green on, but that's very, very much long gone. Um, so we typically just fall under the gas incentives under custom. So 
Um, or, I mean, if you're offsetting electric, then the electric incentive. So basically, if you're saving whatever per cubic meter from a gas perspective, will will qualify under Enbridge. Um, there's some some areas like in the old Union Gas Territory for multifamily, um, for like affordable housing, it's tremendous the 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 offset because they give you like um, I think it's a dollar twenty per cubic meter. Oh wow. Um, yeah, so um, if, say for instance, in the context of a reclad, like I showed a project from Windsor Housing, um, where by the time you you took out the cost of the EFIS reclad at that area, put in the cost of the solar wall, the solar wall was a little bit more expensive because the solar wall was about the same, but you had to pay for the ducting, right? And then, right. but then Enbridge kicked in the rebate and it actually made the solar wall less expensive than if you didn't do it. Hmm. You know what I mean? You just put ethos yeah. in there, reclad. It would have been more expensive than the solar wall, and right. that payback. So, yeah, that's the that's the ideal situation, absolutely for retrofits. Yeah, um, yeah. One of the one of the challenges we've seen is um, when design teams are um, not aware of the incentives, maybe, or they're they're committed to doing the same system, at, uh, the same um, overcladding system everywhere, and then they want to try to find a way to keep the ethos in place. Um, and and then add you know the solar wall on top of the ethos. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't seem like there's a really great design solution for that. Yeah, like like you mean if there's existing ethos or new ethos? Right. Yes. Which one? Existing or or new? If there's existing. Okay. Yeah. So so if there's existing, we can. I mean, we've done it before. So we would just fasten through with. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Really broken. Um, the beauty of it too is is like EFIS is when you're looking at a brick building, say that's been clad in EFIS. I mean, insulation's one thing, but a, a really main thing is now you've insulated that brick, so right. the brick's not freeze thaw and it's not sprawling right. anymore. It rested that decomposition. So, so for us to kind of mount in through that system, it's not that hard. It's a little right. bit annoying to cut some clips in, but but not really. Cut a clip in, fill it with foam. And now you've you basically, you know, you've, you've kept that free thaw cycle and mounted the system on top. In right. a new EFIS situation, what we do is we just basically put some Roxel and then put our system in front of the Roxel. So the Roxel achieves the same thing as the EFIS as right. far as insulation, but it's obviously way easier to slap up some Roxel from a cost perspective. And then our system just mounts proud of that. Absolutely. So that leads to another question then. Um, is there a special... Um, clip or attachment system, or is it sort of the same as any metal cladding you use? Yeah, um, we, so the, the way a project happens is, is we would do the design. So um, we would determine the attachment system. For us, it's less about attaching. So obviously if you're attaching to metal or block or maybe a, a face brick with a structure behind that you gotta use spiral locks to tie the brick to the structure, something like that. Um, there's different ways in which, so it's always sort of, there's a lot of consistency, but it's custom for each design. But the framing design is important because we need the air to move appropriately behind the solar wall and the depth of that cavity. And sometimes the orientation of the framing pieces within the cavity are instrumental in having that happen properly. So we need, from a design perspective, we need a, an even flow of air through that solar wall across the entire surface of the solar wall, which is if you've got a, a building that's 200 feet long and the, all the ventilation's on one side, well, it's kind of hard to get those farthest perforations in. So sometimes we've got to do stuff behind the wall so, oh, um, in order to facilitate that and have the airflow equally. Um, so uh, the short answer is we design it, we supply it, and it just turns into shop drawings. And then the longer answer is from like, say a tendering perspective or construction perspective, um, any contractor that's familiar with installing metal wall systems can look at any set of solar wall shop drawings and immediately know what to do and know how to price it. So it's very competitive from a pricing perspective. You're not stuck with say like our installers, you know, coming in, you can use any kind of local trade and where our engineering team is pretty good at taking 45 seconds and bringing them completely up to speed on on what's different about a solar wall versus typical metal wall. So um, great. Components are all standard, but the way in which it's done is always custom. Right. OK. Yeah, that's a, that makes sense. Knowing now what you're what you're dealing with, that makes sense. 
Um, sure. Okay, let's go to another question here. Um, so this one's uh, sort of about the temperature. The temperature coming off the solar wall uh, is pretty high. Um, I'm not an engineer, so let me ask the question. Uh, but it seems much higher than the makeup area system would supply. Um, so how is it tempered uh, for these makeup air requirements? Yeah, good question. Um, and, and full disclosure, people get wowed by big numbers. So as you might imagine in a presentation, we're showing you like, hey, look, right? We're not always getting 100F above ambient. So, um, and very often it's by design. So, so basically there's a couple ways to approach it and it depends on the building type. Um, so we can design for high volume of air with low temperature delta, or we can design for high temperature delta, lower volume of air. It depends on the needs of the building. So one of the ones I showed there for McCoy, Wisconsin, they wanted us to basically be the heating system, um, which we could be on, you know, a third of the days, um, just because the solar energy is variable, right? Um, right. But very often we want to be, you only want a few temper, a few degrees of heat from our system because you don't want to overheat. Um, and we do a whole bunch of crop drying projects like all throughout Central America and Africa and Southeast Asia, et cetera, where like if you're drying peaches, you can't go hotter than the temperature because now you're not drying them, you're cooking them, right? So we're very good at, at, at designing a system to kind of fall within certain parameters. Okay. Um, take an apartment building, for instance, or let's say a warehouse. If, if your ventilation system's tie, you know, set at 65F for a warehouse, um, and that's the set point on that unit, if you end up delivering 72, um, you're not gonna overheat that space. Right, it's just there's not enough air to overheat the space. But what you may do is you might take the load off some of the infrared heaters or something like that that would be running otherwise. So, um, or for instance, an apartment building, you might have electric baseboard heaters in all the units and gas ventilation. Well, if we're pulling in the middle of winter, if we're making that air come in at instead of 68 or 70, we're making it come in at 73 into the hallways. Well, now that air is going to make its way into the suites and maybe offset that as electric baseboard heating system. So right. uh, we, we, we're always aware of what we're designing for. Um, and often that extra heat is welcome um, because it's offsetting something else. In some circumstances, it's unwelcome. And we know that up front in the design and make sure we design accordingly. Right. OK. You know, yeah, worst that, case, that was a great example that, um, because that's that we're getting a lot of that. And I think that's what this question is is aiming at is sort of um, particularly that that makeup air in a um, an apartment building type of situation um, yeah 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 the, the the general rule of thumb is if your hallway is 73 instead of 68 or something like that and that's going into the suites because that ventilation air is not sitting around it's moving right um, it's not like the entire hallway is receiving that there's not that much ventilation air. It's only a percentage of the air. So you're not going to make it uncomfortably warm, but you ultimately you're offsetting other heating loads in the building. Right. Uh, and then okay. in a worst case scenario, we keep in mind, we have a summer bypass damper for all summer that opens and lets in fresh all summer. So for our crop drying applications, if we ever go above set point, that bypass damper just opens partially. And now your oh, temperature. Right. Of course. Yeah. Okay. So that's, again, uh, I'll refer back to your earlier comment. That would be one of the things that needs a bit of maintenance that's not technically part of the, the solar wall itself, but is a component of the, uh, the incoming the, air unit that would have to be maintained. That's right. Yeah, the damper. So uh, maintenance on the damper, we sort of say no maintenance, but basically when someone's swapping out the filters on your air handler, you, what you do is you just actuate the damper and make sure it's not rusted shut. Right. Okay. All right, this one's a little bit, maybe we'll see what you can, what can, you can do with this. Um, uh, for the same area of solar wall um, compared to building integrated PV, since they use the same, they effectively use the same wall space, um, mm -hmm. which system would provide the best net uh, energy? And I'm, I'm asking this question because also there's another one about, you did a project uh, that had uh, PV integrated, um, and I, I know that that was something that maybe you weren't selling very hard, or maybe it was just a, sort of an option. But um, so comparing the two and maybe the combined system, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So we were, 
we were, I guess we were somewhat early on BIPV, like building integrated PV. We did some of the first high profile type projects around like 2006. Uh, we did Beijing Olympic Village in BIPV for prior to the 2008 games. Concordia University in Montreal, we've done some housing buildings with it. Um, PV's changed a lot in 15 years, uh, cost from a cost perspective, et cetera. So, um, we still do these types of BIPV systems, but the best bang for your buck is solar wall, bam, right? So as far as a footprint, because the efficiency of solar wall is so high, again, it's not magic. It's only we're, there's no magic work because we're just taking BTUs and moving them. We're not changing their state. So the efficiency is correspondingly much, much higher than trying to make an electron excited and run down a wire, right? So um, the the foot like the the energy production roughly between pv mounted on a wall and solar wall mounted on a wall is about four to one so on our bipv systems we're about 75 percent heating 25 percent pv it's the production of those systems right. um it's more so when you don't have pv mounted on top of solar wall because the solar wall performs better without pv in front of it um but then you take out all the summer months right so at the end of the day, you look at a year, if you're looking strictly energy production from an EKWH perspective, it's about 75% solar wall, 25% PV if they're sitting side by side. Okay. Well, that, that basically aligns with everything that uh, I've seen in my uh, modeling these out as well, but I haven't had the pleasure of doing a combined system. So thanks for that. That's really I should say too, from a carbon perspective, that's often very different because Depending where you are in the country, for instance, if you're in Ontario, like you can save a lot of power, but you're not really saving carbon. So all of that savings you have on the on the gas side is, is massive from a carbon perspective. Right. Yeah. I okay. I see. We're basically out of time. We have got about a minute left. I have one one short question that uh, this doesn't really make any sense to me. So I'm assuming it's an engineering thing, and I'm hoping that it'll make sense to you. Um, what about specifying these systems, Division 7 or Division 22? Um, 7, um, almost always. Sometimes you will see them in 23. Um, stick it in 7. <laughs> <Don't>. <laughs> All right, perfect. Uh, seven, seven's your, your wall systems. Um, it sits in Section 742, 13, I think. Um, something like that. 55. I don't know. I don't want them in front of me. Um, <laughs> and then, um, um, then the mechanical, the ducting just kind of sits in section, your ducting section, which is 23, I think. Um, and that's kind of part of the system, but it's also really just part of the main ducting system. It kind of disappears in the, uh, from a tendering perspective, because um, it's, just, it's just more ducting for the mechanical. But you really, for the mechanical, you're just locating an intake somewhere. That's all the solar wall really asks for. Give us an intake here. And, and that, that's the only difference. Okay. Well, with that, I think we're out of time. Um, everyone, you have Todd's uh, um, contact information. You saw it on the screen. I, I'm going to distribute our presentations. Um, uh, assuming that's okay. We didn't confirm in advance, Todd, uh, if we can send this out as a PDF. Yep. Great. So you'll have the, the presentation um, and the contact information so you can get directly in touch with him and he will send you a proposal for your building and answer all of your questions. This has been really, really great. Uh, we talk a lot about solar wall and we often don't have time to get into the gritty details of design. And this was a really great opportunity to get many of those um, sort of high level questions answered. Um, and, you know, some interest, I guess, from me in how some of those detailed questions are as complicated as they seem, because on every building it is a little bit different and it is really a custom solution that is sort of, um, you know, custom fitted, even though all the parts uh, are sort of pre-engineered. That's really, um, yeah, really good to hear that. From a design perspective, because architects do these creative things with our, pro with our system, and then we kind of take credit for it. You know what I mean? <laughs> We just engineered it. They dreamed it. And we go, look what we did, right? But we didn't do it. So it's, uh, it's, it's really nice. Yeah, it's perfect. Well, I think it's time for us to sign off. But thank you again, Todd. Uh, really appreciate your time. And thank you, everyone, for um, joining us today for the webinar. 
As always, you will receive an email with the link to the presentation, a video of the recording, and uh, some links for um, the upcoming webinars that hopefully you can make. Um, so with that, um, we'll sign off. Thanks again, Todd. Have a great day. Yeah. Thanks very much, Al. See you.